having a test class. And I always get questions about this, like, um, where do we put in the students that we're going to test? Um, do we have to create a routine that allow us to enter the names and other information about a student or whatever? And the answer to that is no. Because remember that eventually the components that we create, our Java classes, are going to be connected to a GUI. All right? Um, we're not at that point yet because GUIs in Java are a little bit involved. All right, so we're not writing GUIs right off the bat. All right, we're writing the business logic classes. So in the example I gave last time, we wrote um, a class assuming that we're doing a, a, a application for a pizza place. You have to do a student class to calculate tuition and so on. Eventually, yeah, that would be connected to a GUI somehow. All right, whereas you would enter in the information, I want to order a pizza, I want it to be large, thin crust with pepperoni. I want another pizza that's small, thick crust, no pepperoni, and so on. Well, you'd actually enter that in. That comes later on in the semester. What comes on now is we're creating those components, but we have to test those components. We have to test them to make sure that they work. So what we've done in the case of the pizza example is we've actually created a unit test, which is not complete by the way. Um, maybe it's sort of complete, but it, it's not really complete. All right? Because we haven't, uh, we've, I guess we've tested two of the possibilities. We've tested um, the bake time for whether it, it is a thick or thin crust. And that's the only thing that, that the bake time depends on. But we're going to add today a method to do the calculation of the price of the pizza. All right, and I think we said something like it was 8, 10, and 12, and then an extra dollar for whether it has pepperoni or not. So we'll add that piece of functionality to this. And then we'll talk about testing it, because to test it, we should test all the possible combinations to make sure that's correct. What does that mean? That means that we should test small, medium, large for thick crust and thin crust with and without pepperoni. Now, if my math is correct, that's 12 possibilities. So we're going to hard code 12 pizzas. Now, that might seem like a lot of work, but keep in mind that if we go back and change this, we want to make sure that our code still works. So we'll run this test class again. Now, you can get clever and create arrays and loop through them if you want to. All right, um, But the brute force method is fine too. Keep in mind that this test class that we're writing is kind of throwaway code. It's not going to be part of the final application. Right? But it's essential to make sure that the business logic classes that we have work. So we're doing, in effect, unit testing. Later on, when we connect this to a GUI and connect this with the other classes in our application, we'll be doing uh, system testing, where we'll test everything and make sure everything works all together. So to answer your question, whoever asked it, and I think maybe a couple people asked it, you don't, have to, you don't have to write code to accept the student's name and accept the number of credit hours and accept their residency. You can simply hard code a couple of students, like I've done here. All right? Um, except I, I hard coded a couple of pizzas. All right? And then you can go in and um, run through the test and make sure you get proper answers for each one of the scenarios. All right, let's go in and let's add, let's add the calculation of the cost of the pizza to our pizza class, just for additional practice. So, it's going to be a public method because we want other classes to be able to use it. It's going to be double. I'm going to say calculate cost. All right, double cost equals zero. Then I'm going to have if statements that's going to look at. kind of pizza it is, 
I was using S, M, and L. So if the pizza equals small, it should be size, not crust. And we'll do 8, 10, and 12 for small, medium, and large, and we'll add a dollar if there's pepperoni. We add one to the cost, and then when we're done, we return the cost. Pardon me? Yeah, it should be 12. Thanks. Now, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to put and the name of the method, which is calculate cost. This should largely be review for you, and I can take any questions that you have for that. So now we're going to test the two methods for this. Because remember, we said for our application, these were the things that we were interested in a pizza being able to do. We want a pizza to be able to tell us how long it's going to take for it to bake. We want a pizza to be able to tell us how much it's going to cost. All right? So, notice that by virtue of me making a pizza class, I have available any of the methods that exist for that pizza class. So last week I was asking what the bake time is. This week, since I added the calculate cost, I can ask for a pizza, gee, what is the cost for that pizza? And it will tell me. All right. Let's review what I'm doing here. And again, I have a couple of hard-coded pizzas here. I have a pizza. I set the size to L. I set the crust to thin. I set has pepperoni to false. I create a second pizza. We're going to spend a good part of the second half of class talking about this statement in detail. All right. We create a new pizza. We set the size of that pizza. Remember, all we've done is we've said we had a pizza. We haven't specified any of the characteristics of that pizza. That's what we do with the set statements. Remember from last time, we make our variables, our, our attributes, private. So that no one except no, nothing, no other classes outside of the class itself can access those variables. Now you might think, well, what's the good of that? Well, we provide methods by which you can access those parameters. And that just gives us a little bit more control over how those attributes are used. So we have public methods that allow other classes to set the size of the pizza, to set the kind of crust, and to set whether it has pepperoni or not. So if you want to access any of those methods, if you want to set one of those attributes when you make a pizza, you have to go through the method. And then we have some methods that do the calculation. And after we've set the properties, we can then go in and ask what the bake time is and ask what the cost is. Now again, keep in mind that in a real application, um, these values would not be hard-coded in. You, know, you couldn't depend on the first customer of the day asking for a thin crust with pepperoni or whatever. right? You would be accepting those values from a GUI. And the values from the GUI would be extracted and put into the object. And then when you press the button, it would call the appropriate methods and display what the bake time is. 
and display what the uh, cost of the pizza is. All right. So let's save this and compile and run it. Are there any questions right now? All right. Let's go. into our desktop folder. Here's all my stuff. I'll go and make it bigger. Maybe not that big. Still kind of big. There we go. And I can compile it by typing in Java C and unit test. Dot Java. Since it went all the way through and didn't show me an errors, I can assume that it compiled correctly. Just to be sure, I can do a directory. And notice that I have one class file for every, one dot class file for every Java source file that I have. It was smart enough to know that my unit test needed the pizza class. So it compiled that as well. So the Java compile was smart enough to recognize what needs to be compiled. And if it needs compiled, it will go and compile it. All right. In fact, if you um, were to change, for example, the class, uh, the unit test class, and not change the pizza class, it would see that it hasn't been changed since it was last compiled and it wouldn't compile it. I'm pretty sure that's how that would work. So it's smart enough to know when it needs compiled and when it doesn't. So now I can run it. And I get that the bake time for pizza one is $10, bake time for pizza two is $12, bake time for thick is 16, bake time for or the cost of uh, pizza two is $9. And I should go and verify that that's correct. All right. Small was 8 with pepperoni, yeah, it was 9. Uh, large was 12 without pepperoni, it should be 12. And sure enough, that's what I got. It's important to actually go in and do the math yourself and make sure you have the correct answer. Yes? Um, how would you like, put, like, currency format? How would you format it? Um, there actually is uh, a way to do that. Um, Right now, I wouldn't be overly concerned about that, but it is a good thing to learn. Later on, when we use GUIs that are like interacting, we would we would do that for Java format double as currency, and we will see how we can do that. So there are ways to do that, to format it. So we could format it that way. That's not really, uh, how do I want to say it? It's more complicated than you might think it would be. 
And, and I don't really want to talk about it. That'll be something we'll talk about um, later on when we get into GUIs, when we are worried about the output looking nice. All right? Okay, now how many test cases should we have in here? Strictly speaking, if we're going to do this, and we're going to do this right, what I should do is... I should have a small, thick, with pepperoni, a small, thick, with no pepperoni, a small, thin, thank you, with pepperoni, a small, thin, with no pepperoni. And then the same thing repeated for medium and large. So I would actually have 12 test cases to test this exhaustively. And again, you could write arrays and you could loop through it. You can use four loops and arrays just like you can in C Sharp. Or you could just go in and hard code the different instances. Um, with copy and paste, we could, we could do that in a very short amount of time. But that would be thoroughly testing it. You know, your code doesn't work simply because it passed one test. right? Most of the bugs that exist in, in applications are situational type bugs. In other words, it's not going to be wrong every single time. That maybe the price of a thin crust pepperoni large is calculated wrong. All right. Well, unless you're doing a good job figuring out what you need to test and planning it and testing it, you know, something like that could slip through the cracks. So you want to take a systematic approach to testing the code and plan out the combinations that you want to test. And again, you can make a unit test file. And the beauty of this is, is if they change the rules about pricing, so if we go in and we change and we, we raise the price of, 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 of this, or we make it so that thin crust pizzas get charged a different amount than thick crust pizzas, all right, then we already have our test. All right, and we simply make our changes to the business logic object recompile it, rerun the test, and we can see if the, the new results are, are what they ought to be. Okay? Questions about this? All right. I promise that we're going to spend, that we're going to spend a lot of time, I promised that we're going to spend a lot of time looking at this instruction. And I say that because when I was first coding Java, I used instructions like this all the time, but I didn't really know what they meant. I just knew that, yeah, that's how you make an object. All right? I want to make sure we really understand what's going on here. Because if you, don't really want to, what, uh, if you don't really understand what's going on here, then a lot of the things that happen in Java are going to be confusing to you. And the only way that I can talk about this is to take a step back and talk about the difference between primitives and object or object references. There are two kinds of variables, primitives and object references. Now, as the name implies, primitives are the simple kinds of variables. The only thing that primitives have are a value. int i equals zero is an example of a primitive. If everyone follows the naming convention right, you can tell primitives by the fact that their data type is lowercase. So int is a primitive. Double is a primitive. Boolean is a primitive and so on down the line. Those are all lower cases. Whereas the object references, provided people follow the naming convention, ought to be capitalized. Well, what does it mean when we talk about a primitive? 
The only thing a primitive has is a value. That's it. All right? So let's write a little snippet of code and let's play computer. All right? Back in the old days when we used punch cards, playing computer was something that you had to do to make sure your code worked. Because with punch cards, you put in the cards, ran it, and then maybe two hours from now or maybe tomorrow, you got your results. So you want to be pretty sure that it worked before you wasted a, a day by running it. So let's say we have a little snippet of Java code that looks like this. All right. Int i equals 0, int j equals 0, i equals j, j equals 20. Let's analyze how that would work. Int i equals 0, what that does is that creates something called the stack, a variable which is simply a name that we give to a memory location. And because it's a, pri a primitive, the only thing that it has is a value. So if I create an integer, an int, called i, and say i equals 0, what I am doing is I'm putting the value 0 in the memory location named i. So in i creates a memory location named i that I'm going to put integers in. i equals 0 goes and puts that value of 0 in that memory location. That's all there is to a primitive. It's the name of the variable and a value. So I come on to the next statement and I say int j equals 10. Well, this part of the statement creates a variable called j that has a little memory associated with it, a certain number of bytes, and I put the value 10 in those. So now, if I was able to, to zoom in and look in memory, I'd have two variables. One named i that equals 0, and one named j that has a value of 10. i equals j, what do you suppose that statement does? Pardon me? No? Yeah, what it does is it simply takes what's in j, takes the right hand of the equal sign, whatever that is, and puts that value in the variable named i. So the right hand side goes into the left hand side. So you're right, i can't have the value of 0 and 10, so what it does is it gets rid of the old value. That old value is gone forever. So it has no memory that it used to be 0. Its value is now 10. All right? So when you do an assignment, and this is called an assignment, by the way, i equals j. What that does is that takes whatever's on the right side of the equal sign. And it could just be a variable or it could be some calculation, right? It takes it and it figures out what the value of that is and then it stores the result in this variable named i. So when we're done with this, both i and j have a value of 10. Now I say j equals 20. What does that do? Well, essentially the same thing, right? It takes whatever's on the right side of the equal sign and stores it in the variable on the left-hand side. So, after these statements are done, I would have a value of 10 and J would have a value of 20. Any questions about this? 
This is pretty basic to any programming language. Every programming language works more or less like this. In other words, each variable could only have one value. With a primitive, that's all the variable has associated with it, is a value. And if I do an assignment and assign one value to another, it takes a value from the one variable, from the one storage location, and copies it into the other one. So if I had something like this, j equals j plus 300, it would take the value of this, j is 20, plus 300 is 320, and it would store that result back in j. Okay? That's how primitives work. Pretty basic. Each of the variables is simply a memory location where you put a value in. That value can only be one thing at a time. If you put in a new value, you get rid of the old value. And when you assign one var variable to another, you copy the variable from one storage location into another. Now let's compare that to how a object reference works. Okay, because they work different. Let's say I have pizza P1. P1 equals new pizza. Pizza P2, P2 equals new pizza. Now again, you can do a shorthand with this and say pizza P1 equals new pizza. Or you can break it down into two lines. Does the same same thing, the net effect's the same. But there's two different operations, and these two different operations are important when you talk about object references. Because object references, there's, with objects, there's actually two things itself, two things with every object. All right? There is the pointer to the object, and then there is the object itself. So, pizza p1 sets up a variable named p1. And this variable can hold pointers to pizzas. Pointers to pizzas. Like maybe a bin number that the pizza's in. You know, hey, the order for Zellers, that's in bin number 23. You know, if you think of an actual pizza shop. So if I say pizza P1, I'm going to set up a memory location. There's no value in it initially, but it's not going to hold the actual pizza object. It's going to hold a pointer to it. This is what actually creates a pizza object. New pizza. So if I say P1 equals new pizza, what that does is that actually creates on the heap, which is a different section of memory, a pizza object. And the memory location of that pizza object, the address in memory where that pizza object lives, gets stored in the object reference. Notice how that's different. There's two things going on here. There is a pizza pointer that points to the pizza. Then there's the pizza object itself. That's different than what we had here with primitives. Primitives are simple. All you have is a variable, and the variable, con variable contains the value of that particular data type, 
an integer or a boolean or whatever. Here, the variable in an object reference doesn't contain the pizza object itself. It contains a pointer to where in memory the pizza object is. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. Pizza uh, objects of different kinds can take up a lot of different memory. There's small objects and there's big objects, right? So when you allocate memory for an object, you don't know until you create the object how much memory is going to take, all right? But you do know how much memory a pointer is going to take. So I can create that variable with a pointer, and then I can go and create the object in the heap and point to that object with the object reference. This law instruction, P2, or pizza P2, does the same thing, creates a pointer to a pizza object, and then P2 equals new pizza will create a new pizza object and will assign wherever that's created in the heap, it will assign the address of that to that variable. So in the case of object references, the variables contain addresses to the data, not the data itself. And those addresses are called pointers. All right. Now, here's where things get different. So far, well, so far there's a little bit of a difference, but here's where it really gets different between primitives and objects. If I do this, what do you suppose happens? P2 equals P1. The address of P1 goes into P2. So it will copy over this address. In one respect, it's really no different than this. The contents of the variable goes from here to here when you assign it. But what's different is the nature of that value. And this value isn't a value, this value is an address. So the pointer goes here. So what does that mean? That means both pizzas, both pizza pointers are pointing to the same pizza object. So if I were to say P2 set size medium, guess what? I'm changing this pizza. Both of these pizzas point to the same pizza object. So I could either say P1 set size or P2 set the size and it would have the exact same effect. It would be changing the exact same pizza. Yes. Great question. Does pizza 2 still exist in, the, exist in the heap? And the answer to that question is no. All right. It may actually be there for a fraction of a, of a small period of time, but there's no way for it to access it because nothing is pointing to it. All right. If nothing points to an object, that object is dead and will shortly be what is called garbage collected. All right. There is, a, there is a, so an aspect of the Java virtual machine called garbage collection. And what that does is it looks for objects in the heap that don't have anything pointing to them. And in this case, these are the only variables involved. Nothing is pointing to this object here, which means there's no way we can refer to it. Because to refer to a pizza object, we have to have the address of it. Therefore, with nothing pointing to it, it's dead to us immediately, and at some point, and I'm not talking about like a week later, I'm talking about milliseconds later, the Java uh, virtual machine will garbage collect it and get rid and free up that memory for other stuff. And that's really the important reason for garbage collection, is if you can't point to an object, you can't do anything with that object. And if you can't do anything with it, it's useless, in which case you want to free up the memory so that memory can be used for other stuff. So that's why there's garbage collection. We'll go over this over and over again. We'll go over this next time, probably, and probably the time after that, because it has important implications.
For example, let's just bring up one implication. If I say if i equals j and they're primitives, they're integers, what does that mean? Means, means what is the same? The values of those variables are the same. In other words, in memory location i, there could be a hundred in memory location J, there could be a hundred. What's the statement if P1 equals P2 mean? Depending on your perspective, is either exactly the same or is completely different. <laughs> All right. Right. That's what it's asking. It's asking, does, do these two objects point to the exact same object? So in other words, if P1 had a pointer to the object in location 1,000, and P2 had a location, you know, pointed to the pizza in memory location 1,000, then those two would be equal. So if we compare objects, we are asking, are they literally pointing to the same object? literally pointing to the same object. So if I made two different pizza objects and I made both of them thin crust, pepperoni, large, if I asked if they were equal, unless they pointed to the same pizza object, it would tell me that they're not equal. Doesn't matter that all their parameters match. What matters is are they literally pointing to the same pizza? All right. That's why you have to be very careful when you compare objects. That's why, if you notice in this example, I don't say if size equals quote s, because size is a string. What is a string? It's capitalized as an object. So I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't want to compare a string to another object because I could get misleading results. All right? Now here's the interesting thing. Java takes care of that for you a little bit, but uh, not completely. All right. We'll revisit this because it's, it's, it's a real important concept to cover. And in fact, if we look, if you look in the book, there's like exercises, like it'll create a bunch of objects and assign objects to each other and then ask you when it's done, what's the value of such and such. So those are good exercises to go to test your knowledge. I do want to focus on one particular aspect of this, and that is this statement here. New pizza, or new whatever the object is called, is what creates a new object. It's what puts it on the heap. All right? And then we're assigning that object to be pointed to by P2 in this case. That is a special method, believe it or not. That is called a constructor. All right? A constructor is just as the name implies. It constructs an object. It makes an object for you. Now, we look at the pizza class. We don't have anything called a constructor or anything like that. We don't have a method special for that. And the reason for that is this. If you do not define any constructors, the Java compiler 
sort of inserts a, a constructor for free. It does that for you. And it's a constructor with no arguments. And it's a constructor that simply allocates the memory that's needed. Doesn't do any initialization. But a lot of times, you want to, when you create the object, you want to initialize it too. All right? So maybe what we want to do is we want to create a pizza object. And we know with a pizza object that there's three parameters, right? There's the size, there's the crust, and there is whether it has pepperoni or not. So I might want to create a constructor that will allow me to create a pizza object and initialize those variables at the same time. So what I can do is I can do this. Public, there's no return value. I then have the name of the class again. All right. That's an indication that this is a constructor. And I can specify some arguments. And I can then initialize those variables as part of the constructor. If you think about it, it makes sense. What's the use of saying I have a pizza, but I don't know what size it is, I don't know whether it has pepperoni or not, and I don't know what kind of crust it has. It's kind of weird to think of that. Any pizza you make is going to have those attributes. So I might as well require those attributes when I make a pizza class. So what I can do then is I can set the size to arg size. And now when I create a pizza, I can create it and I can give those parameters. So how do I do that? Well, let's go to my test, unit test. And I can actually get rid of this. And I can say L. Thin. false, where these match up the arguments in my constructor. I'm going to comment out these lines of code. We'll come back to them in a minute here. So I'm going to comment out the second pizza for now. So. I can, in one instruction, I can create my pizza pointer with pizza equals p. I can construct a new pizza object, put it on the heap, and I can initialize the three properties by saying L, thin, and false. Those will get plugged in to the constructor and we're all set. So let's go and compile this, save everything. And it tells me the bait time for pizza one is 10 minutes, which I assume is correct. Cost for pizza one is 12, so that's correct. All right, let's uncomment this out. Let's uncomment out the second pizza. All 
I'm going to get a compile error. All right. Why did I get a compile error? This, I didn't touch those lines of code. I just commented out and uncommented out. Yes. Because I called a pizza, I called a pizza constructor without arguments. Okay. That worked before, though. But I have a constructor. The way constructors work is, if you do not have, if you have not defined any constructor, the compiler gives you for free an, a no argument constructor. All right. If you do define a constructor, then the compiler takes away its free one. All right. That sounds petty, right? Well, if you're going to do it, I'm not going to give you the one for. It really isn't. The thought is like this. If you're creating your own constructor, then you know what you're doing. So the compiler is going to say, I'm not going to do anything for you then. All right? Because maybe you don't want the ability to create a pizza class without having a second argument or without, without supplying the arguments. You know? So maybe you don't want a no argument constructor. So if I wanted a no argument constructor, I would have to create one of my own. And then what I could do then with it is I could um, give some default values if I wanted to. I could default the size, you know, I could pick the most common values. Maybe a medium thick crust with pepperoni is like the, the typical thing that people order. So I could create a default constructor that initialized those attributes to some default values. In fact, I'll go in and do that so we can wrap up today just to show you how, well, how would we create this? I'd create my no argument constructor, and I could then go and assign values to it. But these would be like default values. So I could set a size of medium across to thick, and maybe we assume that the default piece has pepperoni on it, and so we could default that to true. No. What makes it a constructor is, by virtue of the fact, is it says public, the name of the class again, and then a list of arguments. So I could put, I could rearrange these, I could put those at the bottom. Usually I will put the constructors at the top of the code. Um, and again, if in doubt, always comment it. You know, like that. Here are my set methods. So now we should be back in business. All right. I think we changed the size of that second pizza, so it's a slightly more costly. But you get the idea. So how does the Java Virtual Machine know what constructor we want? We have two constructors. When I run this code, how does it know which constructor to use? It looks based on the arguments. And you better, have an, you better have a constructor that matches up with the arguments that you're providing. So for example, in line four, I'm passing a string, a string, and a Boolean. I better have a constructor that accepts a string, a string, and a Boolean, which I do. In this case, I'm passing no arguments. So I better have a constructor that accepts no arguments, and I do. How many constructors can you have? Yeah, not really limited. All right. What is the restriction on, on constructors, though, as far as their arguments? I can't have two constructors that have the exact same arguments. So if I had a constructor that accepted a string, I could not have a second constructor that also accepted one string. 
I could have another constructor that accepted two strings or three strings or whatever. Or like in this case, I could not have a second constructor that had zero arguments. I could not have a second constructor that accepted a string, a string, and a boolean. I could have a second constructor that accepted a string, a string, and maybe defaulted and didn't have an argument for the uh, pepperoni and maybe defaulted that to uh, true or false, whatever the proper default was. Yes? I could have another method that had the same arguments as this, but I couldn't have another constructor that had the same method, the same arguments as this. So like, you know, look at it this way. Sort of the full name of a function is the name of the function plus the list of arguments that go with it. And I could only have one per name, including the arguments. This is known as function overloading or construction, constructor overloading. So I can have multiple constructors, but they all have to have second, uh, different arguments. I could have two calculate cost <laughs> methods, each that had different arguments. All right, like maybe there's a different cost for delivery. So I could have one that defaulted whether it's delivery or not, and another that I passed in an argument whether it was delivered or not. And I could calculate the cost a, a different way if it was delivery. So for any given method or constructor, I can only have one per combination of arguments. And again, in this case, I have string, string, boolean. I actually could have another constructor that was boolean, string, string. So everything about it matters, this is the order and all that. Essentially, the idea is, is, is a compiler has to know which constructor you want to use. And it uses what arguments you provide as an indication of what constructor you want to use. And therefore, that better be unique. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to tell what constructor you want to use. All right. We will review this next time and continue on. Uh, are there any questions right now? Yes. Uh-huh. Can you repeat the question? Okay. Right. Okay. Well, remember, what you have to have, what it sounds to me like you have, the situation you described where you're not getting any output, is you don't have a unit test maybe, class, that actually creates the object, sets the different attributes of it, and then calls the method asking for the results. Yeah, when we go up in lab, we can look at it. But yeah, remember that in the class itself, we're not hard coding anything. We're doing everything based on parameters and arguments and all that. In our test code, that's where we're actually creating and actually setting the specific values. Again, eventually this will become a GUI, but for now it's our test class. But yeah, we can look at it up in lab. Yes? Uh, so, let's, how does the, the test code work? Like, how does it know where, what, where the different classes? Is that just by default? Or by, by default, it's in the same. Because I haven't specified um, a, uh, a package name, it's called in Java, because I haven't specified a package name, the assumption is, is that it's in the same folder. All right, so that's why for now, keep everything in one folder. Don't use any package names. And if you compile it, it will, it will see it in the same folder, and it will call it that way. Yeah. Other questions? Good, good question about the, the path for it. And later on, when we get into like larger applications, you'll want to separate things out. You know, you won't want to have all of your code in one place. You'll create packages for stuff that goes together. And then you'll have to identify, like, well, the, by pizza class, I mean the pizza class that lives in this package or that package. All right. We'll see you up in lab.